Uh, so today we're sitting here with uh, Dana Thomas. She's a New York Times bestselling author and a journalist, having worked at the Washington Post and Newsweek, and written for the New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, Vogue, and Financial Times, just to list a few. And we're here talking about Dana's latest book, Gods and Kings, The Rise and Fall of Alexander McQueen and John Galliano. A really, really great book. As I was telling Dana, I'm reading the book and I'm thinking, it's cinematic. It had all these ingredients. That, like It's just being begged to be made into a movie. Um, it's not a work of fiction. It is a true tale, but true it was so great. So, Dana, is this a story of fame, riches, betrayal, wretched excess, and fall from grace, or is it just a tale of fashion? Um, <laughs> actually, I think of it as a cautionary tale. Oh, but yeah. it's a book about these two guys who were trying to create really beautiful things in a world of go-go global commerce and mm -hmm. they got eaten up along the way. Yeah. When I worked at the New York Times I had an editor named Amy Spindler who had me do a piece one year on Jeremy Scott mm -hmm. who was a fashion designer now at Moschino and back then he had his own little company. This was probably in 1999 or 2000, 2001, somewhere in there and she said that I want the piece to be about how fashion eats its young. That's mm -hmm. how she put it. That it builds them up and then it knocks them down. And I think that's often the case in, in a lot of different professions, but it's particularly acute in fashion, that you're always looking yeah. for the new, the next, the next great thing. Mm -hmm. And so along the way, you have some carcasses along the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jeremy was knocked down hard, and he's managed to finally come back, and he's at Moschino, he's doing great. But these two were total victims of the, of the machine. And... Um, and no one, I mean, people saw it, but they didn't see it to the degree, you know, the suffering to the degree that they were really suffering. And, and then they just collapsed. And they weren't the only ones. I mean, Mark Jacobs has been to rehab twice. Mm -hmm. Donatello Versace went to rehab mm -hmm. uh, and had to have a serious intervention by Elton John to get there. She, and um, there was a young designer at Belmont who had to be hospitalized and mm -hmm. cancel his show for mm -hmm. because of a case of what they described as nervous exhaustion. Mm -hmm. That, you know, these weren't, this was happening around. It wasn't just these two. And McQueen, of course, was the most mm -hmm. acute case. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they just, they were, they were two artistic souls to have the strength to keep up in the gigantic world of global commerce. Yeah. So that's sort of an interesting dichotomy because you can't have that spark of creativity that drives these big businesses along without that creative and artistic spirit. Right. So is the resilience that, say, Jeremy Scott sort of exhibited as opposed to the fragility of the McQueen right. and perhaps Galliano to well, some extent? So is it addiction? Would they have these problems in another industry or does this industry well, propel those insecurities forward? Well, in, it's interesting because for Jeremy to succeed, mm -hmm. what he did was he withdrew from all this. He, and he went to LA mm -hmm. and he based his company in LA, already a sunny place, which keeps your mood up. <laughs> and um, But also away from the man-eating system mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Paris, Milan, and New York and somewhat London. He just said, you know, I'm not gonna play that game mm -hmm. and be in that arena. And he would show his collection in a showroom in Paris mm -hmm. and the buyers would come and see it. Yeah, I, I remember I started in Italy and I didn't find the same pressure as you saw when everything moved to Paris. Absolutely. It's sort of that year it just started and the speed, even for me to be a, uh, to do my work, I just found it very, um, very extremely, um, you couldn't take your time with it. Right. You had to think really fast. You had to be on the next, the next. And it's exhausting for my end. I used to love it. I like, yeah. just love it. Well, I thought Jeremy's it, you know, response was really interesting. He wanted to be this Paris couturier, and then he realized he didn't because it was just too dog-eat-dog. Dog. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he withdrew to L.A., which was not known for its fashion scene. I mean, somewhat. But There's Rick, a few designers, and they do red carpet work. And, and your guy Rick Owens, but it's a, a and Rick Owens, but he's based in Paris. Mm -hmm. But he hasn't followed the, 
bob under a big house, so he's keeping his own house, so he has control. Yeah. Okay. So no one's in his his collection. You'll find there's a more staple pieces in it all the time. Not always trying to be the next. The next, no. he's doing his thing and saying true to what he loves to do. Right. Absolutely. So when you have somebody pushing behind you and he has nobody pushing him. Exactly. Now, so who's to be, if we had to lay the blame anywhere? Who's to be blamed for this? Is it the bosses at the big houses, or is it the consumer? Like our desire for the the new thing, the next new thing, because fashion has moved so fast now we're and with fast fashion we're constantly shopping right you know, and well, it's easy now with e the internet you know, yeah yeah, the, yeah. So no, i don't think that? i don't think it's the consumer's <laughs> fault because the consumer is it's sort of like saying it's um you know cl the people who go to mcdonald's fault for eating the fast food but yeah. you know it's been had all this stuff put in it to make it completely addictive so and you want to keep eating it around. and and mm -hmm. that it's cheap and it's fast so you know Sorry that you got addicted to it. Um, I think that the, there was a major shift, which I discussed in my first book, Deluxe, mm -hmm. about how fashion had been luxury fashion. It had always been about classics and about building from one collection from the previous collection, and that that all shifted in the 90s, and the businesses, when they were taken over by businessmen who, you know, investors, financiers, who had no connection to the fashion business whatsoever, but knew how to make money. Mm -hmm. um, they changed the model from that to something much more global, and they adopted the fast mm -hmm. fashion model, where whatever we showed six months ago, or last spring, fall, or spring, summer, is completely out of fashion mm -hmm. compared to what we're showing in fall, winter. It's not, mm -hmm. It doesn't build on it. You can't put on the jacket from this fall over the pants from last fall. Mm -hmm that um, we're going to show skinny pants this season and then tulip skirts mm -hmm. next season and mm -hmm. broad shoulders and then skinny shoulders mm -hmm. and plaids and then solids, you know, mm -hmm. so that you would be forced to go back. You would be out of fashion mm -hmm. and you would be forced to go back in the store and buy the new mm -hmm. fashion. Yeah. And so that the sales would continue on and on and on and on and on. Because mm -hmm. it was always about growth. Now mm -hmm. that they had shareholders, they mm -hmm. used to be privately owned companies. And now they had as shareholders, they mm -hmm. needed to always show growth mm -hmm. and increase in profits every quarter. And so to do that, they did two things. They kept opening stores mm -hmm. and they had to switch out trends really mm -hmm. fast so that you, could, you had to go in and keep buying things in those stores. And that was what really hit McQueen and Galliano hard, mm -hmm. was having to come up with these ideas all the time, newer and newer ideas. And then it started not just being fall, winter, and spring, summer, but being resort and holiday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it was free then fall. changing. <laughs> it was free, then changing free, every free. three months and then every two months yeah. and trying to keep up with Zara and H&M when, in fact, what they were doing had nothing to do with Zara and H&M. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, Zara and H&M were trickle down of mm. these guys. So if they just kept to their mission, mm. they could have continued to influence, mm -hmm. you know, they could have slowed everything down. Right. But the businessmen, the money crunchers, mm -hmm. the, the number crunchers, the mm -hmm. guys who looked at, and you know, executives who were looking and deciding everything based mm -hmm. on spreadsheets, they're like, we need to do more uh, yeah. to sell more. Right. And, it, and, you know, today's designers, people say, you know, how do young designers today mm -hmm. keep up with this? Well. When Galliano McQueen went to art school, it was art school. Right. Now that art school has some business classes. Right. And a lot of these young designers not only are getting their undergraduate degree from the art school mm -hmm. with some business classes, they're going on and getting a graduate degree in luxury fashion management. Mm -hmm. So they understand how to be managers. Mm -hmm. They know how to tell other people what right. to do rather right. than doing mm -hmm. it themselves. Right. Um, and they don't have to generate so many ideas. They have teams mm -hmm. and the teams all, you know, and everybody's, right. and the star designer actually doesn't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you know who the designer of Gucci is today? Do you know who the designer of Valentino is today? Do you know who the designer of Yves Saint Laurent is today? Right. I would say the average consumer would say it's not Yves Saint Laurent. Right. <laughs>